Hey, y'all. Welcome to part two of our conversation with our amazing speaker on the Do the Change podcast. We're going to hop right back into the conversation. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spotify page, and follow us on Instagram at Do the Change podcast. Yeah. And you know what? I That last part you said about like the um, doing the work while you're in these academic institutions and for these academic institutions and then kind mm-hmm. of stepping back and being like, okay, like how does this translate outside of these spaces? Mm-hmm. I think that's so, I'm going to just say it's so real because I think that um, at least the, at least maybe it's just the way that I kind of view it, but it's like a per, like a, the, the measure of a person is really determined by how you impact others. And yeah. I think that if you're like doing the work within ins- using institutional resources to do work is awesome and great. But I think figuring out how to, particularly with Ivy Leagues like Harvard and like Yale, like these institutions do have a history of extracting from our communities. It's like, how can we use those resources to to then restore the harm that's been done? And I think that's what you're pointing out of like, yes, it's great to do that work, but, and it's great that like you were saying, like, it's always great to be the first because there needs to be a first, but it is kind of like jarring that 2019 is the first. But it's also like, yes, it's it's great, but also like, let's, let's go to the next five, six, seven, 10 steps of like, what do we do now? You know? Exactly. Um, Because I mean, let's keep it 100. Like we have, we have, we've had a black president, a black U.S. president. We now Mm -hmm. have a black female um, vice president of the United Mm -hmm. States. But what has changed about the condition of black people? Like, yeah. if we look at where we were like 20 years ago and now, like some would argue that we're worse off. Right. Right. Uh, and that's not yeah. to say that those individuals being in those spaces is not valuable and it's not inspirational. Um, but what's happening with our people? Like, I think that we really right. have to try to figure out, like, is to understand that it's not enough to be the one that makes it out. Right. Because like mm-hmm. my cousins are brilliant, but they didn't get to go from Compton to Rancho, right? In some ways, like, Rancho could have been more traumatic in other aspects, but, like, what I'm getting at is, like, resource access. Right. Mentor, like, Dr. Tarleton, like, how many students get a Dr. Tarleton in their life, you know, or have a mom who, like, can, even though she might not be as familiar with your dreams, still, like, uplifts you and, and believes in them. So, um, I think that that's, that's just been such an important thing for me to remember and, and to stay humble. Yeah. Like, yeah, I'm at Harvard Medical School and Harvard Kennedy School, et cetera. But like, that's not enough. Like I am enough, like, and I, and I believe in myself, but I think that yeah. it's easy to get comfortable and to feel like, right. yeah, well, you know, now it's up to them to try to get here. Yeah. Right. And I'm, you know what? I'm really glad you said that because that transitions into my next question in mm-hmm. regards to like, how can we help our community? So you are the founding executive director of We Got Us, um, which is a really cool grassroots organization. And so can you talk to us about really that dream stage of that program, which it sounds like it's probably tied to what we just talked about. Um, And yeah, so where did you draw the inspiration from? And what was like that process kind of bringing that to life? Absolutely. So basically um, it was, I want to say it was 20... 20. Yeah. And I went home for Christmas break. We're in the pandemic. Um, and the vaccines were first approved. And I just remember getting so many text messages and phone calls from family members like, hey, like, what's good with this vaccine lash? Like, do you think that this is safe? Do you think that it's for black people? Like, these were the texts and calls I was getting. Um And as I was responding to folks, you know, having phone calls and stuff, I started to think about how I was in this unique position, like as a Black woman and also as a Black woman in medicine, because Mm -hmm. I kind of have my my foot in like both of these worlds. Mm -hmm. And I think that the medical institution has this like really problematic history um, and this problematic present when it comes to interfacing with our communities and I was like but I wonder like how many people have access to like a cousin that's in medical school Mm -hmm. and the reality is not not many right so 
we think about like there's like 13.5 percent um of of like our society that's black and physicians only black physicians only make up you know about five percent six percent of the profession right but yet there's so many studies that are coming out about how racial ethnic concordance leads to better health outcomes and there was data coming out at that same time that um even around the vaccine black folks in particular were more likely to want to seek information about the vaccine if it was coming from somebody that looked like them and understood their life experiences right um, so this is kind of like the history um, and the context that got me starting to think about We Got Us. Mm-hmm. But then as time went on, I was realizing that the way that the media and like public health officials were going about trying to get Black folks vaccinated was all wrong. They were Very trying wrong. to show on television like, oh, yeah, she a Black nurse. She getting vaccinated. So then you should, too. Or LeBron James got the vaccine. So you should, oh too. Oh, my gosh. Yes. And like, it was almost offensive. Like it wasn't because, a- because they're weaponizing the exact thing that we that we like th- that exact feeling of oh this person looks like me I trust it. They were weaponizing it to then you know like using it in the wrong right. way. It's like right. okay now now we don't know who to trust. You exactly. know exactly exactly yeah. that point exactly a hundred percent. And then on top of that, there was all this focus on like oh, well, Black people don't want to get the vaccine because of Henrietta Lacks and Tuskegee. Right. I'm like, I have never heard Tuskegee or Henrietta Lacks ever talked about at my dinner table. Like, that was not a conversation that, like, that Black folks were having. Maybe some. Maybe they were probably having it because they saw it on CNN because you brought it up. Right, right. right. Now now everybody like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on one second. You're right. Yeah, let me do it. You're right. Actually, you just added something. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Like, but but the thing that we are talking about at our dinner tables is the experience we had when we got a pap smear last week or how long it took to get an appointment or how that receptionist might have disrespected me. Or how right. somebody disregarded my pain when I was in labor. Like those right. are experiences with the medical institution happening like today and yesterday that are influencing the reason why we don't trust you to get this vaccine. Right. So that was like the context that I was like trying to help people understand when I was having conversations with like my white colleagues. Like they were like, Lash, you know, what do you think about this? And I was like, we need to have an honest conversation and reckoning with medicine and public health's like roots in racism. Uh, And we need to acknowledge the fact also that this vaccine is not a silver bullet. Like, sure, people can get vaccinated, but what's going to happen when, like, this housing moratorium ends? Or what's going to happen when, you know, people are disenrolled from Medicaid? Like, you know, we were putting, like, the vaccine was, like, a tool, but it still was not going to fix the broken house, you know? Um, And I think that those were the points that I was really trying to get across with people. And I was like, this is the strategy that we need to help Black folks learn about the vaccine and decide if it's the right choice for them. So that's where We Got Us came from. I love Issa Rae. I love Insecure. And I remember We Got Y'all. And I'm how the so glad world- you said this because I wanted to ask so bad. But I'm like, if I'm wrong, this is not going to be good. But okay, continue. Sorry, I'm so glad because I was like, there's no way it's this similar. Like, there's no... Yes, yes, yes. That's so awesome. (laughs) Yes. So, so yes, on Insecure, for for folks uh, who might not know, um, there's like this problematic white woman who's like the executive director of this nonprofit called We Got Y'all. The logo is this extended white hand with maybe like (laughs) five or six black children um, in the white hand. And it's like, we got y'all, right? So I was like, okay. I know what this nonprofit is going to be. It's going to be like young people collaborating with community organizers and people in the health field to like make sure that we have information and access to the vaccine. But what's the name going to be? And I was like, ah, how about we got us? And instead, like, (laughs) instead of it being like the white hand carrying us, it'll be like four hands uh, coming together, interlocking as a way of saying like, yeah, like we're going to get through this together, essentially. So yes, that is like the origin story of We Got Us. <laughs> that was, okay, because when I tell you, I was like, I was like, I I saw it and I said, ain't no way. And then I had to Google it. I'm like, no, I'm not crazy. Like there's like, it's, it, all I'm going to say yes. is 
It's beautiful because I feel like too, like, I don't know if you meant to, but tapping into that cultural reference, because insecure is a, I feel like now I could say it's a cultural reference for our community. And I feel like just seeing we got us immediately. I went, it's Issa Rae got something called we got, wait, hold on. And then it made me, I literally (laughs) was pulling up the two, like, hold on. And uh, it just made it that much more, like, I I don't want to, it was like funny and like a, this is, this is super dope. Like funny, like this is great. And then also it just adds like that extra of like, I already feel connected to this because I'm connected to that like show. Yes. Yes. 100%. That is awesome. And you're genius for that. Seriously. Oh, oh, thank you. Yeah, unfortunately, I feel like I feel like they don't watch enough Insecure in Boston because like not a lot of people understood it. But I already know, like, if this was like founded in LA, everybody (laughs) Easter Ray would be knock knock on your door immediately. I might have been the Barbie movie, you know, like current, yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to jump to the next question, but that is, oh, that just, you just answered a deep question I had that I didn't have an answer to, but I'm so happy I could do that for you, sis. Yes. (laughs) Okay. So the next question is how do you balance being a student in a medical institution in space that has also perpetuated historical and present harm, like you shared on black communities and communities of color. And then also like, how do you recenter yourself, like, in those moments? So I can only imagine, like, maybe this is me reaching, but, like, sitting in those classes and you're hearing about all these different techniques or calculations where you're like, mm, like, I don't like that. But then also um, having that inner goal of, like, okay, but this is, I'm going to use this to create healing. Like, how do you balance, like, those kind of emotions or experiences? And then also, how do you recenter yourself? Like, are there things you kind of do or people you talk to and stuff like that? Yes, this is such an important question. Um, I think for me, it goes back to like our general discussion of like purpose Mm -hmm. and my why. Because when I came here, it was always like I'm loyal to my people, like I'm loyal to my community. I'm not Mm -hmm. here to just be a talking head for Harvard. Like, that's not my objective and it never will be. So I think that I was very blessed in that early on in med school, like my first two, three months of med school, I wrote my first academic paper ever. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is when I was accepted to the New England Journal of Medicine. And it was about how we were learning about Lyme disease, but we were only learning to recognize how Lyme disease presented on white skin. And- In doing more research, I learned that Black folks tend to present with later stage Lyme disease, which has serious implications for the heart and the brain, the neurological system, uh, because of the fact, or, you know, authors believe that it was partially because of the fact that we aren't learning to recognize these dermatological illnesses on patients with darker skin. Um, And the response that I got from that paper was incredible. Like, it actually was able to make a difference. Um, It just helped me learn that writing was a way that I could make a difference and express myself and do so in like a tactful way. Because I think that sometimes it's easy to be like, yeah, well, these institutions ain't nothing and they do this, they do that. But it's like, what, what what are you trying to change? Like, how do we get more exact and granular? Like, we're talking about the system, like who are we talking about in the system? Is it the CEO? Is it the president? Um, Is it the manager of the custodial staff? And I think the more granular we get, the easier it becomes to make change. Because sometimes when we just chalk it up to the system, it's like, who who are we trying to get at? You know what I mean? Um, And it just makes us a little bit more effective or it's been, that's what's helped me become more effective as an advocate. I also wrote my first op-ed ever, and it was basically to advocate for funding for this program that helped fund me to to take the MCAT um, or to do MCAT prep, basically. And it's called HCOP, the Health Careers Opportunities Program. Um, It's like a federally funded program that was at risk of losing funding. And I wrote this op-ed and um, it I collaborated with the AAMC and was able to essentially like help that program get an increase in funding beyond it even just being saved and kept in the budget and I was like 
oh, so I just had like these early wins in my life. Yeah. Like, man, like this writing stuff is 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 awesome. Like, hey, you're like okay, you know what I was like, okay, well, let me just get back to typing. You know the present for a couple million. You might yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And what was wild is that like um I was I had just got on Twitter like after I got accepted to medical school, and that's when like this idea of med Twitter starts to become more popular. Yes, I love med Twitter. Yes. Um and a lot of my op-eds that I've written or, or think pieces have started as tweets. Um, oh, okay. Me just kind of expressing myself like that Lyme disease article, like that came from um, a tweet. And what's wild is that when I write a cover letter sometimes for a paper, yeah. I'll leave the tweet in there so that the editors can see like mm. that this is something that people are interested in and that it's like a popular discussion that's really smart yes really smart. yes yes, yeah. yes I think that like as social media becomes a more prominent way to like disseminate knowledge and research mm. and stuff I highly suggest like linking in whatever you're tweeting or writing and stuff on your professional pages okay. um so, so yeah back to your original question I think that that is what it has allowed me to kind of like survive in this space is mm-hmm. number one, staying true to my purpose and why I'm here. Um, number two is learning to speak out when something is wrong and doing so in a way that is actually constructive. Mm-hmm. Like I can say, yeah, like Harvard, you racist as hell, but it's like, okay, what I try to do is say you're racist as hell. And this is how you're continuing to harm our patients. Because Mm -hmm. you're supposed to be an institution of healing and what you're doing is antithetical to healing. So therefore, thus, we must try to be an anti-racist institution. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, (laughs) I'm here for it. Yes, I feel like, you know, and this is this is my strategy. Like some people are like, nah, like let's we need to come in a different way. I'm like, yes, we need everybody coming in with different types of strategies. But I think that like as a student leader, as a writer um, and as someone who speaks often about these topics, I think that that is how I've been able to hold my institution accountable while mm-hmm. then also maintaining their respect for me as like a right. colleague. Right. Because right. Like, right. I'm right. trying to help us become better at what mm-hmm. we're supposed to do as healers. And the way that we're operating right now is not helping us achieve that goal. And I think that that is how I've been able to kind of maintain both of those sides but I'm always loyal to my community first and I'm always going to hold my, my institution accountable. Yeah. And I, I love that. Cause I think that that area that you hold yourself in is, it's just, I, I can just relate to it hundred percent because it's like, you can still say what you need to say, but then also like, it's like just being respectful, but also like, okay, but I said what I said, but right. it's, you know, and then also like if also holding people to their word. If you're saying we're going to be a quote unquote anti-racist institution or we're mm-hmm. going to be X, Y, Z, but then your actions are saying otherwise. And that's like an easy of like, Hey, we said this, but we're doing this. And therefore, like you said, this, 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 this. And that's like a respectful way to be like, y'all are mis- it's misalignment on whatever's going on in there. Yeah. Um, and exactly. I think that that is the way, or I don't want to say it's the best way, but it's a, it's another path for, yes. for folks who maybe aren't as radical or aren't as like, get rid of all of it. And it's like, right. yes, get rid of all of it. But also you can also leave with the, we can get rid of all of it. And then we should also replace it with X, Y, Z because right. of what you said in X, Y, Z and whatever type of stuff. So right here for that hundred percent. Exactly. Exactly. And I think what's also allowed me to like maintain my sanity is like, I can, I can do that work within Harvard, but then like mm-hmm. we, this is where I'm able to like be my radical community. Yes. Like, with itself, right. I'm like, you know what? Cause you know, we got us is like still going, um, we're mm-hmm. still doing the work. And for example, we have these acupuncture clinics that are actually named for Dr. Oh, Tobu cool. Small, who's based out of North- Northern California. He was a personal physician to the black Panthers. Um, uh, and we have these acupuncture clinics that we do during the summer. Um, we censor anti-racism in all of the pamphlets and resources that we create for the community. Yeah. It's great because like we got us is my vision for creating these spaces for black folks to come together and we got us and like help us right you know, based on our own resources in time. Um, but then I'm also like, 
this space has so much power, like these, these elite institutions, and we cannot just allow them to continue to cause harm as they, as they continue to today. So, you know, we can't reform these institutions necessarily, but we have to hold them accountable because um, that's what's causing the immediate ills like today. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I feel like we've already touched on, I was going to switch to tea time with Tyra, but I feel like we've touched on a lot of these. I'm just, (laughs) I'm like, I'm like, whoa, it's been tea time this entire time. But um, (laughs) there were, I guess there's two that I would be interested to like hear your thoughts on. So we are now entering Tea Time with Tyra officially, I guess. Um, So the first question is, do you see a place and or space for non-traditional or non-Western practices of medicine? And like, what has been your experience with that? And I guess, how do you imagine maybe seeing it being integrated more into the medical space? 100%, 100%. I was no specialist or expert um, in regard to acupuncture, Mm -hmm. but um, one of my incredible classmates uh, who did some work at the Freedom Clinic in Oakland, uh, one Mm -hmm. of my good friends, Bernie, um, was like, Lash, like we should bring this to Boston. And that's kind of like how the Small Steps Project started with us. And I didn't realize like how much acupuncture was promoted by and used by Black folks, like even here Mm -hmm. in the U.S., like as a traditional practice. Mm -hmm. And even when we're out in the community, so many community members will be like, oh, I miss acupuncture. Like I used to do this all the time, but now it's so expensive um, because Mm -hmm. it's been commodified and it's kind of become like a sexy uh, self-care thing um, that wealthy white folks will do. And it kind of is seen as like, oh, I think just in general, it's so interesting. Like when black folks do something, it's seen as um, Mm -hmm. like not or (laughs) not clean or not real medicine. But then like when you package it and make it um, a business uh, and you make it something that wealthy white folks do regularly, then it's like, oh, yeah, that's like that's like the next high class. Right medicine or extension of medicine or whatever the case is like I mean I've been yeah. reflecting about this a lot it frustrates me so much when I see like um cannabis like businesses everywhere that are not black oh, owned yeah. and it's like yeah you know like smart can and it's just like so cute and I'm like it's just so wild to me that people's lives were literally like destroyed, destroyed. and now yeah. it's just cute and fun but that's an aside but basically, um, through the We Got Us project and the Small Steps project in particular in our clinics, that's been my exposure to, to traditional healing. And when my patients like bring up acupuncture or Reiki um, or sound therapy, I have never been one to be like, what? Like, you need to just take your insulin because no, um, mm-hmm. Because we know that everything that is mainstream medicine is mainstream because somebody got to put the filter on earlier so that it would become mainstream. And a lot of these filters have been put in place by individuals who benefit from a current system or a current aspect of mainstream medicine um, or because they didn't view it in their, you know, perception or because of their um, subjective opinion that it was worthy. And I think we even see that with medical journals. Like now we're starting to see more things published on racism and medicine, but people have been talking about this for a very long time, but people didn't see it as scientific enough to be published. So mm-hmm. I think that's just one version of like how, what is mainstream and what is seen as like, you know, Western medicine, um, how that can be really a reflection of colonialism, um, a reflection of racism and how it manifests in medicine. So I'm all about holistic healing. Um, And I think that the more that we can combine these approaches, and I think that inserting them at the right time in a patient's timeline and care, like I think that there is a time when you do need insulin, right? Because the diabetes has gotten to that point. Um, But I think as, as much as we can bring all those practices in early on, and use them in conjunction to promote healing for patients, like I'm all for that. Gotcha. Yeah. And thank you for sharing that in regards to, I also like the framing of just calling it all traditional medicine, because it's just medicine Mm -hmm. at the end of the day. And Mm -hmm. I think that's 
And I think that's something I'm going to have to integrate into my brain of like, there isn't non-traditional versus traditional. It's just medicine. It's just right. different ways to go about like having the most optimal health yep. for yourself and not for what someone else deems as best for you. So thank you for that. Very gentle correction. I, I got it, but I'm, I, I receive it. Um, no, I should have said, I should just, it's just traditional. It's just medicine. Just remove the traditional versus non-traditional. Um, Okay. So last question in this one, because everything else has been said, <laughs> what is your take? I guess, what is your take on this integration of anti-racism training or just this conversation now? Um, and have you noticed any patterns of co-opting in this space as this is kind of being talked about more in the space of medicine? Mm. So I just, I just, um, actually posted something on Instagram about this very, topic and I'm pulling up the exact quote right now this is from the the Pew Research Center okay Um, and they reported that support for the Black Lives Matter movement has decreased by 16 percent since the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Aubrey Mm -hmm. so what that tells us is that that peak that we saw in 2020 like after their tragic murders Mm-hmm. There was all of this interest. There was all this excitement. There was the Black Lives Matters on streets and on jerseys and on lanyards, right. mission statements and task forces and all of that. Right. Um, but where is that energy now? And what did it truly amount to if now the, the pendulum has swung the other way? And I think that we're seeing that with all types of policies that are happening across the country, like the right. political at the local state and federal level right now is like wildly transphobic racist yep like xenophobic it's just horrible um and I think that in reality like conversations about anti-racism training and things like that I think that they're just conversations at the end of the day We can all have a conversation, but where is the action at and where is the sustained commitment? Like, and what are you doing with your dollars and your funds? Like, don't just give me, um, you know, a position for DEI at your institution, but use that money to invest in in local Black businesses in your community or to actually create like a 10-year plan that is measurable and how you're going to improve the conditions of who's around you. And before you even started this work, did you admit to the fact that you were complicit? Did you outline the way specifically that you had been complicit? Have you done the internal work, the investigative research? Not just saying like, you know, we're sorry that we've done some racist stuff, right. in the past, like a real investigative study to how you have harmed in the past and in the present, the communities that you're claiming that you're going to be anti-racist toward. I feel like that is really like where the truth and reconciliation and like all of that comes in. Um, And I think that a lot of these institutions are just checking a box because it's no longer sexy to be racist. Um, (laughs) uh, Openly at least. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. (laughs) Anti-racist. Yeah. So, so yeah, I think that we have to be careful because I think that this movement absolutely is being co-opted. Um, And I think that we have to start holding and continue holding institutions accountable with their actions because we've seen the data. We heard the data, 16% decrease. That tells us that that really things have not changed. We're going backwards. Um, And that's after a public lynching during a pandemic. Right. Yeah. And I I think that that it's just personally with the, with the co-opting, like that is something where it's, it's just like, maybe it's, maybe it's me, but I also find it like a lot, very disrespectful of the fact of like, you think that our community will just go for the, Oh, look, like here are all the bells and whistles that you want. Like, I I think they, they made like, um, instead of stop, like stop killing us, they just painted black lives matter on the street. I was like, you just wasted more money. Like, like that right. makes sense. And it's just like, I, I feel like just we're beyond the, oh, we're going to do this and all sorts of stuff. It's like, okay, but where's the act? Like you said, action and sustainable, like 10 year plan of how you're going to correct mm. your behavior. And then just saying like, 
y'all use your words to like pacify us. Use the words to call yourself out. Like you said, where it's like do an investigative, like work, like yeah. seriously, and then out yourself and then say, okay, this is what we were complicit in. And here's how we're going to correct that. Yeah. And I think a lot of people don't do that. And that's why it comes off as like performative, like y'all don't mean it, you know? And then yeah. the data you just shared is like demonstrates that to the full extent. So exactly. And this is, is reparations. Like Literally. we're talking about the process of like reparations yeah. and restitution. And that's kind of like what I'm excited about, like, and why I decided to get this public policy degree is because I'm trying to better understand like, what is the role of medical and public health institutions in reparations, like mm -hmm. economic development for communities and like thinking about the levers that we have to actually promote reparations. And I think like mm -hmm. that's where this conversation has to go. Like reparations cannot be a scary word anymore, but mm -hmm. it's just simply like what is due. And I think that there can be no other alternative besides that if we're truly talking about anti-racism at these institutions. Right. right. Okay. So sadly, this conversation is coming to a close. I don't want it to end, but we, whatever. Um, so <laughs> thank you um, for being so open and honest with me and the folks who are listening, because this is just what needs to be said. And I think you gave a lot of like seeds for thought and hopefully folks will go on and read those books that you shared, like uh, the color of law, I believe it was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and hopefully they'll go on and read that and water, you know, water their seeds or yes. along the way. Yes. That's what we're praying are for. You the, are you on the train? Make sure you keep one eye open though so you can see. Yeah, you know, yeah, be aware. <laughs> you know. <laughs> that third eye open. Um, and so I want to end with just um one or yeah, I guess like one question on self-care and also any closing thoughts or advice that you have for just folks who are thinking of like, Hey, like I really want to change my field or Hey, like I'm just thinking on like, how can I just contribute or help my community? Um, okay. So the question I'm going to ask is, Oh, these are both bits. Maybe I'll just ask both. Um, what are some daily or weekly self-care routines or habits that you've incorporated into your life? So you did share that you do read. Are there any other, um, just things you do? Yeah. Um, I think that like before starting um, school, like graduate school or before starting like a new job or whatever the case is, like mm -hmm. just like taking a survey of the things that you do that bring you joy and mm -hmm. making sure that you maintain those things in your life. And I think that like that's what I've tried my best to do. Like for me, I loved running so much um, because LMU was like right by the beach. It was just the best. Yeah. Like that's kind of how I got into long distance running. Um, but now it's just generally important for me to stay active. Like I think that like taking care of like my temple is is critical. And I actually just um, entered this this competition to become an amateur boxer, um, which is wild. Yes, it's called Haymakers for Hope, and I'm raising ten thousand um, dollars to contribute to cancer research and specifically to donate to these two organizations that support Black women and low-income women with any of the costs that come up during their breast cancer treatment. So, yeah. um, so that's a quick aside, but, um, and I'll send you the link to that so you can like share. Yes. It. Yeah, y'all. So like, make sure you donate if you're able or share. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think that for the most part, I just do like what brings me joy. Like I've been able to travel while I've been in medical school. Traveling is important to me. Um, speaking to my family um, weekly, making sure I'm in touch with my mom and know what she's going through. Um, I need to get back on this like I used to be, but like journaling weekly as well. Mm -hmm. And also something I've given grace to myself in is like, even if I don't journal like in a notebook, like I normally do uh, voice memos, even like notes on my phone, just kind of like checking in and seeing how I'm feeling. Um, so, yeah, I think that those are some of the things that have kept me grounded. But I would say what's what's most critical is just remembering and knowing what brings you joy and not letting go of that, even when you're very busy, um, because you have to carve out time for those things or else whatever you're doing can become all consuming and then you'll definitely start to feel burnt out. Yeah. Um, I'm going to start journaling. I didn't even, I used to journal too, like a lot. And I actually found an old journal where I wrote all my goals 
And it was very yeah. tricky to see like, oh, I, you know, it's like rewarding. Yes. Like, oh yeah, wait, I did say that. And it's, but anyways, but when you were talking about that, I was thinking, I was like, I need to also get back on that. Cause yeah. there's, there's it's something to the so spirit. Boring. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. Go back and like, see the personal growth. It's just like, oh my yes. gosh. It's like, especially on those hard days. Yeah. Man. Yeah. I, I totally agree. Okay. Last question is, can you share any specific resources such as books, podcasts, or wellness practices that, you, that have been instrumental in regards to supporting yourself here? You did share that like you are active, but are there like any other books that you're like, y'all need to plug yourselves in podcast? Yeah. Also tune into your podcast. Cause I'm, I'm about to do that. <laughs> Absolutely. I think you'll like it a lot. Okay, cool. So I would say, um, podcasts, y'all gotta check out um the podcast that I'm a co-host for it's like a lot of hosts of the of the podcast um we have like a big team but it's called the clinical problem solvers anti-racism and medicine podcast um we've had over 20 episodes and we've interviewed folks like Ed Young um who wrote um a lot about the pandemic um we've also interviewed uh Dorothy Roberts um Mm -hmm. who's like um an incredible Uh, author, uh, lawyer, scholar around anti-racism and medicine, just like really dope people. So check that out. And we're like all about linking um, all of the different things to anti-racism, whether it's immigration health or indigenous health. So it's it's Mm -hmm. a really good podcast and I'm proud to be a part of it. Um, As far as books go, I would say the books that have been like, oh my God, like this is that one. It has changed me in the best ways. I would say The Some of Us by Heather McGee mm-hmm. um, is incredible. And it's all about how like we have to stop using the zero sum game mentality. And when I say us, I mean, American society, specifically white American society. Um, mm-hmm. And it's about how like, you know, it led this idea of like the, the this currency of whiteness has led to a depletion of resources for everybody. Um, mm-hmm. So it's very brilliant. She gives great examples from healthcare to education and housing. Um, then I would say cast by Isabel Wilkerson, um, mm-hmm. and also warmth of other sons by Isabel Wilkerson. She's just a phenomenal historian. And I think that both of those books have been critical for me. Um, and then I would say the most recent one that I've read that has been like, oh my God, I love this is viral justice by Ruha Benjamin, um, mm-hmm. who's a sociologist at Princeton, um, an author, and she's just super dope. And she also has like race after technology and other great books too, but Mm-hmm. Viral Justice is one of those books that in in light of all the horribleness in the world, it just reminded me that like we are still plotting seeds of goodness, each and every yeah. one of us. And like we have to continue that chain of goodness despite all the negativity that's around us. And it could be difficult to push against that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it just kind of made me feel inspired and hopeful. So I would say I would say kind of like that's that's the collection that I think is really um given me a lot to to kind of have to jump off from and to feel hopeful in doing this work that is often very difficult and heavy yeah I it is very difficult and it is very heavy but I think that just it sounds like the books that you offered are just books to where you can kind of ground your spirit and or learn new things that could help you kind of figure out where your passion is um so yeah, I want to thank you so much for being here. I want to, I just want to, again, thank you for all the just nuggets and seeds you shared. And yeah, so I just want to tell my listeners just to, um, ooh, man, I had a brain fart, a real bad one. Okay. Um, I'm going to just start over and pretend like I didn't say that. Mm-hmm. Oh man, my brain just gave out on me. Um, so yeah, last I just want to thank you again for coming to our podcast and I want to thank all the listeners for tuning in and yeah, see y'all later. Bye. <laughs> okay.